the world is very energy hungry. There are many ways of getting energy. And the most omnipresent form of energy on Earth is the solar energy. And the sun generates its energy using fusion power. Now, there is the world's largest science and technology experiment, which is trying to create the sun on Earth. And I have with me Dr. Bernard Bigo. He's the director general of ITER. And for a layperson, creating this sun on Earth. Uh, Dr. Bigo is a well-known figure for atomic energy. In his earlier avatar, he did a lot of fusion energy work, and now he is looking at fusion energy. Uh, Dr. Bigo, both of us have interacted earlier many times, and I welcome you once again to this interaction for the large Indian audience. Uh, for the Indian audience, Dr. Bigo, which is not familiar with what you're doing, tell us what is ITER and why should India and the world be excited about it? So thank you very much to give me the opportunity to speak to the Indian audience. As you said, the world needs energy. Without energy, there is no life, no social life, no biological life, no economical life. We are fortunate enough now to have discovered fossil fuel. We use a very large okay, amount of fossil fuel now, and as you know, it has some impact on climate and environment, and we need to find an alternate option. And is why, inspired by the fusion events in the sun and the stars, we try to mimic the hydrogen fusion on Earth also. And for doing that, we need quite a large installation. Size matters a lot. If you have not the size, you could not get more energy that you feed in. So how do we proceed in order to get any fusion energy? You need to make hydrogen nuclei to get so close to each other that they overcome their natural electrostatic repulsion and they will be trapped, okay, in a new nucleus, the helium nucleus. In the, in the sun and stars, you do that due to the mass of the sun, of the stars. For example, the sun is nearly 300,000 times the weight of Earth. And at the center of the sun, the density of the hydrogen, what we call plasma, because it's very hot, it's a very hot gas, the density is 100 times the density of steel. And in this condition, with a very high temperature, 15 million of degrees, you are fusing. But on Earth, you couldn't expect to get okay, so large mass. So we need to rely on an other physical phenomena, which are the magnetic forces. If you have magnetic forces, you will be able to confine the plasma to force the nuclei, as in the sun, to collide at very high speed and overcome okay, the natural repulsion. And so we are now building out a large magnetic cages in order to have the similar phenomena as it's happened in the sun. Is why the challenge is so large that we need a very large cooperation. Now, 35 countries, including India, have decided in 2006 to join their best effort in order to build this machine and operate this machine to demonstrate the scientific technological as well as economical okay, viability of hydrogen fusion. So what was the most recent event which has been celebrated and, and why should the world be happy about what happened within the last 10 days? 
As I said a few minutes ago, the program starts in 2007, just after the seven ITER members, okay, China, Korea, Japan, India, Russia, Europe, and the US join their best effort in order to build this machine. So since 2007, okay, we have been designing as well as manufacturing all the large components which, which are necessary in order to build this installation, what we call a tokamak, a magnetic torus. And we celebrate on 28th of July, indeed, the start of the assembly. After the phase for design and manufacturing, we have received the first needed component from Korea, from India, from Japan, from Europe, in order to start the assembly. So we want to thank all the ITER members for their dedication, for their support, and announce that we have passed this critical milestone to move forward toward okay, the final uh, assembling and after that commissioning and operation. Is it correct that one of the heaviest components for ITER is being supplied by India and was probably one of the first to be set inside the pit where the fusion reaction would happen? Absolutely. As you know, all the seven members have decided to procure in kind the various components which are needed in order to operate this machine. And India was in charge to build what we call the cryostat. The cryostat is a big box, 30 meter large, 30 meter high on stainless steel, six centimeter thick, nearly 4,000 tons has been made in India, indeed in the Larsen and Tubro Limited Company in Azira workshop. And uh, this piece is like a can. And uh, it was made of nearly 54 pieces, each of them weighing nearly 100 tons, 10 meter large. And so we weld all these different pieces which came from India by boat. And now, we have made the four pieces, which are the base, the lower cylinder, the upper cylinder, and the top lid of this. So we have now completed this part. And indeed, end of March, we have been able to install the base. The base was a piece 30 meter large, nearly 10 meter high, weighing 1,250 tons, and we need to position these pieces in what we call the tokamak pit, which is, okay, the large a cylinder made of concrete where we will have to operate. And it has been very remarkable that indeed it has been done so precisely that no points on the base of this cryostat was were away from the expected position that three millimeter. Three millimeter was the precision we wow. need and we accomplished that. And so it is remarkable and demonstrate the high capacity of Indian industry. So not only you have a part of the tokamak there, I also have a little bit of the of the cryostat in my office here when I visited Eater. I was gifted by Larsen and Tubro. So this is a very proud steel piece which sits in my house telling me one day we will have the sun on earth. Uh, so Dr. Bigo, when can we expect the first plasma or the first time when this machine which has over a million components gets together and generates what it's expected to do in the first time? So now we have started the assembly phase, as I said to you a few minutes ago, and we expect to be ready by end of 2025 for demonstrating with the first plasma that all the assembling pieces has been fit together as expectation. So the first plasma 
will be in 2025. After that, we will install some new equipment, for example, extra heating system, system to collect the energy, and also system to recycle the fuel. It will take some time because they are first of a kind equipment and we need to position them very carefully. So indeed, by the end of 2028, we expect to have the first time the possibility for the scientists and the engineers to start what we call a burning plasma. Plasma will, will be self-sustained. It will be during 18 months opportunity for the scientists to get knowledgeable about this new machine. And we will move on and on, and we expect to have the full demonstration of fusion power producing 10 times more heat that we will feed in to maintain the plasma by 2035. So we expect by before the end of this century, we will be able to provide this technology to the world in such a way that they could substitute the fossil fuel. It could look quite long, but indeed the challenge is, okay, the size and the precision. We need absolutely to work with the highest quality. Could you imagine that the, that the plasma, nearly 800 cubic meter of very hot hydrogen gases, what we call a plasma, at 150 million degrees, will have to be confined very precisely with the magnetic edges. So we could not go faster. Now, you spoke about 150 million degrees centigrade. Now, I'm told, and, and tell me if this is correct, uh, whenever the machine starts, is it correct that at Kadarash in Eater, it would house the world's coldest and the world and the universe's hottest place literally within meters? You are absolutely right. As I explained to you, to confine the plasma, we need a very large magnetic cages, which will produce very high okay, magnetic field. And in order to get this magnetic field, we need to have what we call superconducting coils, which will be cooled down at minus 270 degrees in order to save energy because the, the electrical current passing through this coil will be 70,000 amperes. So wow. with a so large intensity, if you use just as a standard copper coil, you know, it will be eating a lot. So is why we need this very low temperature. And as I explained to you, in order to have what we call the burning plasma, the self-sustained plasma, producing 10 times more uh, heat that we feed in, we need this hot temperature, 150 million degrees, 10 times the temperature of the core of the sun. So a very few meters away, you will have the hottest okay, temperature ever okay, reached in the universe and the coldest one. Okay, is why you understand now why it is a challenge to assemble all these pieces very precisely and why it takes time. I, I understand there is a challenge. I understand you are putting together a million piece jigsaw puzzle being made in 45 different countries with a cost of over 20 billion euros. But the need for clean energy is now, Dr. Bigo. Every time we hear about fusion energy, it's always 20 years later. Very few people say, in my lifetime, you will see the fruition of fusion energy. Why is it that it's always 20 years later? So first of all, I wish you to uh, have a very long life. <laughs> and be, okay, lucky enough to okay, have experienced this fusion power. But as you know, in the past, many 
experience has been done. And indeed, everybody knows that even if you observe the fusion phenomena with small tokamak, with small installation, it was not possible to have this sustained plasma producing net energy. So why it takes so much time? Because you need to have this very large collaboration. And as you know, it takes time to, got, to get on board China, Russia, India, EU, United States, Europe, and so and so. They are not uh, very frequently working together and agree to join their best effort for very long. And in the past, indeed, many people feel and believe that fossil fuel will last forever. And now we know it is not true at all. And we need to find a very uh, uh, innovative option to replace it. So I would be so pleased if we have started 20 years ago, okay? But it was the fact that it takes time for negotiation. Now, I do believe that we have all the uh, input in order to make fusion power coming on Earth and available, including for India, before the end of this century, before the mid of this century. Okay, I mean 2050. That is too late, sir. That is too late. Is there something the governments can do to make, other than cloning Dr. Bigo, what can be done to make sure that we can get the energy, fusion energy, faster? From my point of view, uh, I do believe it's not possible until 2025 for the first plasma to go faster. Because, you know, all these million of pieces has to be properly assembled. After 2025, if the ITER members want to accelerate the program, certainly if they decide to increase their annual budget, if they decide to foster the industrial capacity in order to deliver okay, the components which are still needed to go to the what we call full fusion power, we could maybe reduce by half time the okay, final demonstration. And once we will have demonstrated the full fusion power, I am pretty sure that the utilities could go fast. So from my point of view, we have to be realistic. You know, it's not so easy that to make the sun coming on Earth, as you said, but, uh, uh, and we have to do it with very high quality. But once it is demonstrated, acceleration could be very fruitful. See, solar energy, wind energy, what are essentially called alternative forms of energy are becoming very popular. Uh, in times to come, will fusion energy be able to compete with uh, these non-conventional forms of energy? My belief is the following. As you said, okay, the humanity until the end of the 18th century rely only on okay, what we call renewable energy, solar, wind, okay, hydraulics. But the world's population has increased from 1 billion of inhabitants to nearly 8 billion. And we need not only solar energy, which have some limitation. The main limitation is coming from the flux of the solar energy on Earth. We could not change the flux energy. So in order to collect a lot of energy as we need now, we will need a huge space. We will, okay, area to, to have uh, this windmill or uh, the solar panel and all these things will be too large. So it's why complementary of the renewable energy, we need a massive, okay, continuous, predictable way to produce energy. And uh, there is no other way from my point of view if we don't want to rely on fossil fuel, if we don't want to rely on nuclear fission power plant with the limitation which are linked to the waste management mainly, we need to be patient. Okay, certainly it would be better to have demonstrated already fusion energy 
But as I explained to you, it takes time to negotiate the possibility to have the large, okay, demonstrators. So my expectation is the following. Until the fusion energy will be available, we expect that we will use as much as we can, okay, the renewable energy, solar, windmill, develop the technology, improve the efficiency, take it as much as we can for local, okay, uh, use. Uh, but when you have a very large uh, urbanization, as it is now, when you have very large plants, okay, in order workshops to produce the goods, we need now the cars, okay, the appliance and all these things, you will need massive energy. And so it will be able to substitute progressively when, okay, we will have okay, exhaustion of the fossil fuel. From my point of view, unfortunately, there is no other option. A lot of people ask me, the current villain for energy is carbon dioxide because it causes global warming and climate change. So how much carbon dioxide or global warming gases would be produced from a plant like ITER or by using fusion energy? Indeed, if you accept, okay, the uh, maybe uh, needs to have some energy used for manufacturing the plant, fusion okay energy don't produce greenhouse gas emission they only produce helium which is an okay a neutral chemicals no interaction with uh, the oxygen or whatever and it will be just escaping in the universe where you have a lot of helium already so no impact on climate are produced by the fusion plants as I could okay, show you very clearly. Could you imagine, for example, if you have a 1,000 megawatt okay, power plant, as it is maybe a standard, and you use coal, every year it will release of the order of 35 million tons of wow. okay, greenhouse gas. While in the case of a fusion power plant, with the same capacity, you will release only 350 kilograms, 350 kilograms of helium. Nothing, nothing, no impact on climate, no impact on environment. It is one of the best advantage asset of the fusion power, beyond the fact that this technology is intrinsically safe. Because at a given time, you have only two grams, two grams of fuels in the large vacuum vessel. And so if any parameter deviate from their nominal okay, values, the plant immediately stop. Okay, there is no storage of energy. There is just a large flux of energy. So you could lose your water cooling system. You could lose the power. You could lose the vacuum immediately the okay, plasma will stop. Big advantage is the reason why the seven ITER members are so keen to see ITER successful. So you, what you're suggesting is that if we have a fusion energy plant which is running, then we won't see an accident like Fukushima or Three Mile Island or Chernobyl. Is that, is that, is that what you're saying? To, to make exactly. a blip? Exactly. Exactly. There is no risk of runaway. There is no risk of a melting down as it happens in uh, Fukushima, as you say. It is one of the major advantage of these technologies. Could you imagine that in the worst case, and the worst case will be in, uh, a fire, okay, because you have some, uh, okay, hydrogen components there. And so if a fire happens and maybe a hydrogen explosion, the nearby okay, people could not have to move away. It is intrinsically safe. So it's a big advantage. Uh, India is an equal member in, in the ITER project, which is coming up at Kadarash, along with the partners which are there in the world. Uh, and India is investing. It's the largest, single largest investment by India in any science and technology project 
outside India equal to about 20,000 crores or $2 billion. Uh, what is India contributing to ITER? India is contributing indeed a lot. Europe is contributing 45% of the construction cost and all the non-European countries as India, 9.1%. But 9.1%, one, as you said, of a 20 billion okay, cost is not so small. And so, as I explained to you, India is procuring quite a large part of uh, the uh, Kotokamak installation. First, the famous cryostat, these big boxes we spoke about a few minutes ago, but also the cooling water system. Now it is installed on the Kadarash site and uh, it will be commissioned quite soon. Very successful. Okay, but also they are procuring many other components, for example, some high technologies development for okay, uh, power uh, uh, supply, some also diagnostics. We want to monitor the plasma. We want to monitor and uh, record the temperature, the size of the plasma and all these properties. And India is also contributing very well with that. Uh, today, today, precisely this morning, early this morning, we receive on the other side the first vacuum vessel sectors. Okay, the torus is made of of nine sectors, like piece of orange, you know. And uh, Korea, as well as India, are in charge to assemble, pre-assemble these vacuum vessel sectors. And inside the vacuum vessel sectors, there are piece we call them in wall shielding, and it is India which are procure this equipment. Uh, uh, we celebrate yesterday at Bangalore, remotely as today, the completion of the procurement of this very critical component, since they are the one which will be the closest with the plasma. So Indian industry is performing remarkably well. Uh, is it correct that the cryostat will be the world's largest flask or the refrigerator, if one may say, that is sometimes told to people here. Is that factually correct? It is factually correct. Never in the world you have manufacturers, a flask, as you say, which will be 20 meter, 30 meter large, 30 meter high, weighing nearly, okay, 4,000 tons. And it has to be made with a precision, which is half a centimeter with the design. So definitively Indian industry has demonstrated its capability. Now, now, while the large components are being given by India, there is one area where India seems to be lagging behind compared to your other member states, which is in giving human resource, manpower, woman power to the ITER project. I'm told today only 25 Indians are there of Indian origin in ITER project, not the contractors, whereas the number could be close to a hundred of them. Uh, one, why are there so few Indians? And is there anything which can be done to increase that number? Yes, definitely. Uh, as you know, the ITER members has agreed that their target would be to provide highly qualified engineers and technicians uh, in a relationship with their share of the construction cost, which means now we are nearly 1,000 okay, in the ITER organization. And so India was supposed to have 90, 95 okay, participant staff. But we are way below, as you mentioned, 25. There is a specific policy in India that Indian could not go out uh, abroad in an organization like ITER for more than five years. And so it makes difficult to select people okay, for just five years when the program has to last so long. 
Second, it is Indian policy to allow only a staff which are belonging to the Department of Atomic Energy to join the EDER project. So despite the fact that India is the largest populated EDER members, and I am pretty sure there is millions of highly qualified staff able to join us, we have too little applicants. We are missing a lot of Indian applicants. Fortunately, the Indian staff we have in the ITER organization are highly qualified. Okay, they are very bright and they contribute tremendously. So certainly, if India could relax their policy, allow us to hire more freely, okay, Indian, including in industry people, uh, or even in the DIA, the Domestic uh, Atomic Energy uh, Department of uh, Atomic Energy, they are quite large. I was told there are hundreds of thousands of people. Yes. So I don't understand why it is not possible to have more people from India. If we have good applicant, we will give highest priority to their recruitment. So I encourage a lot the bright Indian fellow, first in the Department of Atomic Energy, second maybe if there is some relaxation on the Indian policy to join us. It will be a win-win situation. You know, it will be a unique experience for them to work with uh, colleagues from the 35 other countries. Okay, Europe is representing 29 countries with Switzerland. It will be unique on the first large tokamak construction. So I really advocate a lot in order to have some better okay applicants number of applicants larger the number of applicants from india definitely I, I appreciate that you recently hired a very senior person in eater from india mr nalinesh nagaj uh, uh, was it a hard choice easy choice i i believe you went through many interviews so you you are yourself said the quality is good can we expect more people in senior positions? Yes, definitely. We had some very good senior people uh, previously in Italy. The reason I explained a few minutes ago, they left because uh, the uh, contract of employment okay, terminates with a five years contract. Uh, Nalinish Nagesh, indeed, is a very qualified person coming from the uh, okay, nuclear industry in India, he has demonstrated very high quality. And so we had uh, nearly uh, 100 applicants for the position he applied for. He is in charge now, responsible of what we call the corporate department. He is performing very well. And uh, it was obvious it was among the very few best ones. And for the reason I explained to you, I, have, I was very pleased to select him with priority because we miss India. Now, see, India is making two kinds of contributions to ITER. One is in-kind contribution, and we said we came to an understanding that India is not contributing enough human resources. There is another contribution, which is the in-cash contribution. I believe India has defaulted on the in-cash contribution for a few years. Are the member states and Dr. Bigo unhappy with India about that? Yes, definitely. They are very <laughs> unhappy. As you know, as you said, okay, in kind, and India is performing very well. But also, in order to assemble the component, to also monitor the quality, the ITER organization needs to have a budget. Okay, and so every year, there is a call for budget from the members. And unfortunately, India has not been able since 2017 to pay their in-cash contribution. They do it very well before, and for some reason, they face difficulty to provide us the in-cash. If they go on like this, ITER will be in danger. Because, you know, I have to pay the assembling companies uh, for example, 
uh, I say a few minutes ago, okay, they provide the cooling water system, kilometers of pipe, kilometers also uh, of uh, equipment, pump, valves, and all these things. So India is not able to provide hundreds of workers in order to make this installation. So we have to hire maybe European companies in order to do the work. And if I don't pay them, we will be out of okay cash and we will be obliged to stop. This year is a critical year because as you could imagine, after three years without paying their contribution, it represents quite large amount of money. So I am so pleased when I see their procurement with cryogenic, for example, system, uh, cooling water system, cryostat, and all these components. I am very sorry to see India is facing difficulty to procure the cash. You might have to give some leeway this year, sir. This is COVID-19 pandemic year. The economy is not just in India, but across the world are suffering. So you, 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 you may have to give a longer leash. And let, at this point, let me also ask you, are you willing to give a longer leash? And how did you cope with the COVID-19 pandemic at ITER? So again, as I repeat, this year is critical. And I expect that India, despite the COVID-19 pandemic and the difficulty, will be able to provide at least part of their okay, uh, cash due okay, from the past years. Otherwise, we will be blocked. You know, all the other members are procuring their cash, but when we accumulate, okay, they could not, okay, cover this, uh, this missing. We have been facing also in France and all over the world, the COVID-19 pandemics. And it was a critical decision to take when the pandemics hit France and it started to have what we call confinement, which means all the uh, people as to stay home and to prevent to have the pandemic to spread over. And we decide to go on. We set up what we call a continuity plan, concentrating, focusing on the most critical parts in order to delay the ITER project. You said that we need to assemble one million of pieces and even more. Could you imagine if we say we stop and it is easy to say we stop. You just say, please, everybody stop. And it could be immediately. But if you want them to restart working, it would have taken not a few days. It would have taken months. And so a large delay would have been impacting the ITER project. We have been fortunate enough to decide this continuity plan. And all the ITER members has done their best effort in order to keep Okay, moving the project, taking all what we call precautionary measure. Okay, for example, wearing the mask, okay, with some social distances. And I am very pleased to tell you, despite that on the work side, we had nearly 2,500 workers, not a single one has been impacted. The main reason, as I said, is we are on force, very strict precautionary measures, and we were fortunate enough to have received masks, you know, fast masks in order to protect you uh, in such a way that in this condition, okay, we have been able to prevent any uh, pandemics on the ITER site and even in the shop where one. No, I saw during your start of assembly phase, the all heads of state spoke virtually, digitally, remotely. And, and it, it seemed very nice that they came together and you gave an overview by going to different sites. And that was a very nice way of explaining what the ground situation was. Uh, there is one small point on the start of assembly day. Uh, you had the French president speaking. You had the Korean president speaking. While Indian prime minister's message was read by the ambassador to, of India to France. Were people unhappy that India put forward a fairly uh, 
junior person for that particular day? No, as you know, uh, first during the COVID-19, it was we were unable to plan long enough before the events. And I would like to, uh, to uh, take a special day, which was symbolic when all the equipment to be assembled was arriving in France. So we decide early July to go on by 28th of July for the celebration. No head of state we have invited was able to join either. So is why we remind, we uh, request from them to be able either to be live stream during the celebration or to have recorded a message or express a message to, uh, to uh, uh, express their views about ITER. It was not so easy to mobilize all these different persons. Okay, and so to be frank with you, we received, for example, the latest re uh, recording video at six in the morning, the same day of 28th of July, because many head of state have, uh, are very busy and they have a very heavy schedule. So we were very, very pleased to get from Prime Minister Narendra Modi a very positive message. And this message has been highly appreciated. Uh, it has been, as you said, read by the ambassador, and the ambassador is uh, the representative of uh, the prime minister, so it's a very high level from my point of view, expressing the Indian views and uh, the, the words that uh, Prime Minister Naranda Modi has uh, expressed during this uh, message has been very strong and highly appreciated. As you know, he has said that in India there is a long lasting sentences saying that, okay, the world is a family. And so this quote has been very often okay, broadcast among many, many other messages. So from my point of view, I am not uh, at all making any distinction between President Macron, okay, recording, or okay, President Moon, or uh, whatever, and uh, expression made by India. We appreciate that all the head of state have provide a high appreciation of the work we are doing and high encouragement about it to be successful. Now, one of the hallmarks of the ITER project is that while country uh, like India is going to contribute 9.1 percent, but the 100 percent of the the intellectual property or the drawings and the the the, the making of of the whole project would also be available to other member countries. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Is also a uniqueness of this large ITER project that because it is in-kind procurement and all the ITER members want to be able to take advantage of this large project, 100% of the know-how, the intellectual property, will be fully, freely share with the seven inter members in order for them to move forward to build a fission plant in order to deliver energy to their country. Yes, I confirm. Now, the next, actually, when you demonstrate energy being produced, meaning electricity being produced in a plant, would be the next plant, which I believe has been called DEMO. Now, is it possible that the DEMO plant be placed in India, like Dr. Anil Kakodkar, who is an old associate of yours in the nuclear industry in India, has been dreaming of? Yes, absolutely. As you know, uh, now ITER is a research facility to demonstrate okay, the capacity to produce a large amount of heat, which will okay, produce a steam, and the steam will be used in a turbine to produce electricity. So it is an agreement of the seven ITER members that after the ITER program, as we said a few minutes ago, all the ITER members will be able to reproduce 
okay, the same type of technologies in their country in order to produce electricity. So from my point of view, there will not be one single demo. Okay, there will be several demo because once, okay, the scientific, technological, and economical competitiveness will be demonstrated, all countries would like to speed up, okay, their capacity to produce electricity. So no difficulty for having India, okay, having this demo very soon. I could tell you that, for example, already several ITER members are considering to build a demo in Europe, but also in China. And uh, there is a plan, for example, of China that they will start construction of the demo as early of 2040, just five years after we have demonstrated the first fusion power. power. So if India want to develop fusion technologies, they will have all the same capacity as the other members. And uh, as you know, India is the largest populated country. You have not so much oil, you have not so much, okay, material in order to, okay, use uh, other alternate options. So I am okay. very... You're right. yeah. Yes, That's... yes, you're right. I, I do believe that India will be maybe the most interested country to demonstrate that uh, they could substitute coal burning okay, power plant using fusion technologies. Now, uh, in, early in the interview, you mentioned that the Indian uh, people who come there are of high value. How, is, without having to join ITER, is there some way youngsters in India and there are bright very, very talented youngsters. Is there some way they can contribute to ITER without actually coming to Kadarash, which can be more expensive than they could contribute from here itself? Yes, absolutely. You know, uh, I said that uh, the full fusion power demonstration will come in 2035. So the students, which are now 20, 25 years, will be 40. So they will be in full capacity to join ITER, okay, uh, and, uh, for operation, not for construction, for operation. And I guess they will still belong to their national labs or to their university, and we will invite them to come and join ITER. And I feel there will be no limitation for that. Beyond that, uh, we have uh, set up what we call the ITER Scientific Fellow Network. It is a network of fellow all over the world which are working remotely with the ITER project and they could come from time to time to visit us and so I encourage the universities in India which are working on plasma on okay hot uh, energy physics and all these things to apply for this uh, okay ITER scientific fellow network in such a way that they could be trained with their American colleagues, their okay, French one, German one, uh, Chinese one, uh, Japanese one all together. So uh, there is many opportunity for them to join us and they could just uh, send us uh, a message and we will reply in order to invite them to apply. One last question. I am a communicator. I am not a neither an atomic specialist nor an engineer. And I ask you this question once again. The world needs fusion energy as of yesterday. You are not even delivering it today. You are promising it to me 20 years or 30 years from now. Is there something I can make it, I can do for you so that you can make fusion energy and give me carbon free clean energy sooner than that. Thank you so much. Okay, each of us, we have to play the best of our capacity. From my point of view, you are a very good communicators and I am so pleased to speak with you today because I understand you are really knowledgeable about the importance of finding an alternate option. The best you could do is to have continuous interest for ITER. Okay. 
every new step we will pass, if you could report to the public, it will be very useful. Why? Because a so large program uh, with large investment could not go on without the support of the public, without the support of the lawmakers. Okay, and so as long as you will be able to report on the, we expect very much, okay, successful schedule uh, we are uh, passing, it will be the best value for ITER. You know, when I came in, in 2019, 15, sorry, in 2015, as the new ITER organization director general, the project was in difficulty. Very much difficulty. <laughs> yes. And uh, the, the public opinion don't care so much about ITER. They feel, okay, it will never work and so. We have been fortunate enough during the last five years to comply with our schedule. Okay, every day we pass the milestone. As I said, precisely by the end of uh, okay, uh, uh, this uh, summer, we pass the assembling, start of the assembling phase on schedule. So we restore in some ways the trust in the ITER project, the trust in fusion energy. We need to keep us trust within the lawmakers and the public opinion that hydrogen fusion is a credible alternate option for replacing as soon as possible fossil fuels. You said that you would like tomorrow. I know I would like also tomorrow, but I have also to be realistic. You know, I have a physicist. I know there is some physical limitation and I don't want to go too fast and spoil the capacity to demonstrate properly. Quality and safety is absolutely critical when you are assembling such a large uh, system and uh, installation. So I feel sorry, I could not do better. I am working nearly day and night and uh, every day is only 24 hours a day. Any, any message you have for Prime Minister Narendra Modi? He is somebody who believes in science and technology. He believes when he was there in France, he, he spoke about ITER less than a year ago, he himself, and then he gave a message for this start of assembly. So any direct message for Prime Minister Narendra Modi? You are very kind. If I would like to pass a message to uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, first I will say, please come and visit ITER. I guess it will be the best way for okay, uh, encouraging you to go on, contribute to ITER, and provide all the needed resources, despite India is facing a difficult economic climb. I guess everybody which come on site and see what we are doing is more and more convincing to do his best effort to be successful. And any message for the currently 1.3 billion Indians who are starving for energy? Yes, as you know, I have visited many times India. Yes. I have been working with India and I uh, admire these countries with a so large population. They deserve our support. I know it is a growing country. Many, many more people need to get energy. And uh, I would be very pleased if we could provide them this new capacity soon. So is why we appreciate India is a partner in ITER and that we would like them to uh, have the opportunity to support ITER as they have done in the past. Uh, what a pleasure speaking to you, Dr. Bigo. We have spoken to each other when you were in the earlier avatar looking at fission energy and now to speak to you in your new avatar as a man heading the fusion energy project for the world. And I sincerely hope that ITER succeeds and DEMO follows soon and that India also gets fusion energy and electricity from fusion energy in the homes as a clean, green, carbon-free form of energy. And I'm sure India would benefit very strongly with its for its participation in the ITER program. And having a friend like you, who's a friend of India at ITER, is certainly an asset for India, is what people tell me. What a delight speaking to you, Dr. Bigo. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, open discussion and uh, welcome to any Indian willing to participate to ITER. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.